With me tonight, we have a couple of panelists. Dr. Devanshu Verma is a board certified in internal medicine and rheumatology, graduated from the internal medicine residency program at Connemon Memorial Medical Center in Johnstown, followed by rheumatology fellowship training at Drexel University, Hanneman Hospital, and the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He is currently working as an assistant professor of medicine in the rheumatology division at West Virginia University in Morgantown and serving as the Associate Program Director of the Rheumatology Fellowship. He is a recipient of the Exemplar Professionalism Award by the American College of Physicians, Pennsylvania Chapter, 2016, and served as Chief, Chief Resident during his residency training and volunteered at the local Johnstown Free Medical Clinic. So thank you, Dr. Verma, and welcome. Also on the panel is Dr. Elizabeth Klings, Associate Professor of Medicine, Director of Pulmonary Hypertension Center and the Center for Excellence in Sickle Cell Disease, caring for more than 500 adult and pediatric patients at, at Boston University School of Medicine and the Boston Medical Center. She received her BA and MD degrees from New York University, completing her training in internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care medicine at Boston University School of Medicine, where she joined the faculty in 2000. Her research and clinical interests are in the pulmonary vascular complications of sickle cell disease and pulmonary hypertension. Additionally, she is attending physician at, in the Medical Intensive Care Unit at Boston Medical Center. She's a member of the Medical and Research Advisory Council of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America's International Task Force, which meets biweekly to update recommendations for patients with sickle cell disease infected with COVID-19 and is considered to be a national expert on this topic. Thank you and welcome Dr. Klings. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you both for joining us, for taking your time to be with us on this COVID-19 forum, for participating with us. Speaking of participating, we are hoping audience members will participate by posing questions to our panelists. You can do that either directly on Facebook Live, if that's where you happen to be watching us, or if you're watching us on Zoom, there's a Q&A function. You can place questions there. And once we get through a program we've got ready for you, we'll start asking your questions of these two great panelists. What do you say we get started? We're going to start with Dr. Klings. Can you tell us what you've been seeing in your practice that might kind of give us a good stepping off point for this conversation? Great. Well, thank you very much, Chip. So um, as you explained, I am a uh, adult pulmonologist and I do both pulmonary medicine and critical care medicine. So I take care of patients with lung diseases, but also take care of patients in the intensive care unit. And what I'm seeing um, in my practice in terms of COVID-19 are, are sort of different aspects depending on when you're, whether you're talking about my outpatients that I see in clinic or the patients that I see in the ICU. Um, you know, what, I, what we have seen in the intensive care unit over, over, since last spring um, is really the sickest of the patients with COVID, infected with COVID-19. And we are continuing to see um, the very sick patients um, with COVID-19. And, and over the past year, we've learned quite a bit about how to um, take care of these patients the best way possible. And I would tell you that this disease has been very humbling for, for someone like me who's been practicing critical care medicine for um, over 20 years in that um, uh, the rapidity in which patients um, got, get sick with this disease is very different than other viral illnesses like the flu, um, and, um, and even things like um, H1N1 and the SARS viruses that you've heard about, you may have heard about before in the news. And this, is, this has definitely been a challenge for us. I think we've learned a number of things over the past year in terms of um, um, things in terms of how do we can better predict who will not do well um, with COVID-19. Um, and we've also learned that some of the treatments that we were using last year really weren't helpful. Um, and we've discovered other treatments that actually may be helpful in treating the patients. Um, in my outpatient pulmonary practice, um, I'm seeing a lot of different things in terms of sort of helping to manage many of my patients who don't have COVID-19. That's been very challenging. Um, because many of our patients don't want to have any contact with the hospital or the um, healthcare system, and really keeping people engaged um, in their own healthcare has been very challenging. Um, and um, and then you know in our, in my patients who have had COVID nineteen, some of them fully recover, um, but others 
seem to have lingering symptoms that affect their lungs and trouble with their breathing that seems to be um, something that goes on for quite a while after they have the infection. And this is something that we're just beginning to understand, I think. All right, uh, Dr. Burma, same question for you. What are you seeing in some of the people you've worked with and, and what's what's been happening, I guess, most recently? Yeah, well, thank you. I hope the audio is first working well. Uh, thank you everyone again for having me. First off, just to, um, again, disclosures. I don't have any disclosures, no conflicts of interest. Um, if I mention any drugs there, I don't have any relationship with any other companies. As far as what we see in the clinic, a little bit about me, uh, rheumatology. And rheumatology has been unique in the sense that a lot of what we do, as a background, what is rheumatology? A lot of people think of rheumatology as arthritis, arth meaning joint, itis meaning inflammation. And that's a key word, inflammation. We know COVID-19 has different phases to it. On the first phase, in the early infection phase, is when you have part of the, the viral replication. That's when you have the, the flu-like symptoms. And we know the second part of it is when you have the pulmonary phase. And then the second, the later half is when you have the hyper, hyper meaning high inflammatory, meaning your immune system is, is on overdrive, so to speak. And in a sense, that's what rheumatology deals with quite a bit in a similar sense. So rheumatology deals with a lot of autoimmune diseases, auto meaning self, immune meaning related to the immune system. And that's with dysregulated immune system. So a lot of times we need our immune system to fight infections. We wouldn't be alive without it. At the same time, our immune system has a very fine balance between what it recognizes as self versus non-self. What is ours, what who we are ourselves versus something that doesn't belong like an infection, like COVID-19, like any other virus or bacteria. When you lose that, that when you are not able to tell what is yours and what is not, you can end up targeting proteins or parts of your body that you don't need to target. That's when your immune system starts making these antibodies. It starts making these, uh, it starts attacking your own parts that leads to this inflammation. And that's what we see as pain, redness, warmth, swelling, fevers, chills. That's what leads to your blood work being off. That's what leads to the symptoms of different organs involved. And depending on which organ is involved, you have a different syndrome. And those are the different diseases that we categorize them as. So in, when we see patients in rheumatology, they often have their immune system that is already dysregulated. Dysregulated meaning there is already an imbalance of sorts. On one side, you have your immune system that is overactive, which is targeting things that it shouldn't be. And on the other side, when you have an infection, it's, you don't wanna suppress the immune system to the degree that you're not able to fight the infection. At the same time, you don't want your disease to flare. So you have that balance and it's on two opposite ends. If you suppress the immune system to too much, your ability to fight the infection is lower increasing your risk for hospitalization, organ damage, and sometimes with death. On the other side, if you don't treat and you have the increased risk for, for, the, um, for the complications. So when we see patients in the clinic, oftentimes we get asked, and when I say clinic, so in rheumatology specifically, we see a lot of autoimmune. So immune that is, we're talking things like lupus, things like rheumatoid arthritis, things like Sjogren's scleroderma, um, also things like osteoarthritis, gout, uh, a lot of these connective tissue diseases. And we'll get into these later. But in a lot of these cases, a lot of our medications focus on targeting the immune system, which we have the risks and benefits. So a lot of our questions will be, in, especially in the early phases, back in March, and there were a lot of patients in the lockdown happened, things like osteoporosis. Um, we remember patients not being able to get their prolia injections. Um, and those we know if you stop them without transiting something else, the risk for bone loss is even higher. And that was a real concern because you could not miss your medications that were scheduled. At the same time, you had a lockdown happening and it was hard for patients to schedule infusions, which had to be at an infusion center. And getting home infusions was also challenging. So getting access to care for patients who were scheduled for them and for whom it was critical was also important. By the same token, when you look at the inpatient side, you have patients who really need certain medications 
for example, someone who may have vasculitis. Vasculitis meaning itis, meaning inflammation, vessel meaning a blood vessel of sorts. And these are patients who may have things, for example, their they have ulcers on their skin, their hearts, um, their eyes, their, a lot of organs can be involved. And in these cases, you really need to suppress the immune system that, can, that is overactive. And in those cases, when you're using medications like cyclophosphamide or rituximab, these are medications that cannot wait. At the same time, you have to balance out the risk of, they're really gonna be at higher risk if they do get infected when they're on it because their immune system is suppressed. That's one of the other things to keep in mind. There is a difference between immunosuppression, immuno meaning the immune system, suppressing meaning literally lowering it, as opposed to immunomodulation. You're modulating it and changing it. Analogy to think of it is like a car. Immunomodulating is like you're changing the oil or you're changing the tires. The car is still the same. It still runs at the same speed. You're not changing any characteristics. Acceleration is the same. You're just modulating it. You're tuning it up. You're not really changing how fast it goes or its speed or anything. Immunosuppression is almost like putting the brake lever on. And that changes your speed. That's like looking at the engine part of it. So those are two very different things. And a lot of our questions is, well, when is a good time? Is it safe, number one, to do the immunosuppression? And number two, a lot of the questions recently have been, from the vaccination perspective, am I going to be, number one, can I get it? because they may be on medications that already suppress the immune system. Do they need to be off of it before or after? Are they going to be medications that are going to blunt the response to the vaccine? The first question back then, back in the early response was, am I at increased risk for getting the infection if I continue my medications? So there were a lot of patients, of course, who are already on medications and are experienced early on. And the guidance in the beginning was to continue but not start anything new. There have been newer guidances, which we can get to later. Um, and those have really been helpful in deciding, well, once you get a vaccine, you should hold the next dose, for example. Or if you're getting a certain medication, you should do it at the end of the cycle, infusion cycle, as opposed to the beginning of the cycle. And those ones have been, have been tremendously helpful. And now we now have a better idea of which medications are, are associated with higher mortality. In other words, chances of hospitalization and hospitalization and chances of death, really and which medications are less likely to result in adverse outcomes to cause harm. And that's really been helpful with the studies. There's been Global Alliance, um, there's been a, the Global Rheumatology Alliance has been grateful. They have a series of thousands of patients that's been incredibly helpful in gathering data. And that's been in, in part inspiring to have a community coming forward. Um, as far as the, the side effects concerned, there have been patients who've gotten COVID with serious medications. And thankfully with the inpatient team with now with the dexamethasone and with the plasma therapy, they've done well. They've also seen patients who've had side effects that were unusual. And these are case reports, but they have been patients who have had, for example, new onset lupus after COVID who never had it before, who have been treated for something different. So we are still understanding how something like infection, and we already know this from rheumatoid arthritis, it's a simple analogy. It's a sort of a two-hit hypothesis. People have the genes inherently that predispose them, that make you susceptible to having a second hit or a second trigger that activates them and it makes you more predisposed. So COVID being another infection style, we know that once you have infection, your immune system can be dysregulated and sort of mimic another autoimmune disease. So we're learning more and more about more Auto, auto meaning self, immune meaning activating the immune system, more and more diseases that are being almost caused and triggered by COVID. And that's been an, an ongoing, exciting area of, of research. Thank you very much. Um, circling back to Dr. Klings, I mean, let's, let's, can we talk a little bit about the vaccines? We've had two vaccines on the market, adding a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Can you kind of tell the folks at home kind of explain what, from your perspective, what, what, what's better, what's, you know, what they should be thinking about. And, uh, you know, are we getting enough people vaccinated? I mean, I think I know the answer to that question. So, all right, that's, those are great questions. So, you know, to answer your last question first, no, we are not getting enough patient, uh, people vaccinated um, and quickly enough um, to really be able to achieve um, that term that's called herd immunity, which means sort of immunity of the entire population 
entire population. Um, you know, I think each state is handling this process a bit differently. Um, I do not live in the state of Pennsylvania, um, as uh, your um, bio of me alluded to. And in Massachusetts, um, our rollout has been challenging, um, and um, and I think this we've met a number of the challenges that are happening in a number of different states. There currently are two, and actually now a third vaccine um, got emergency use approval over the weekend, um, uh, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And what I will tell you about um, about them is that any vaccine is better than no vaccine. Um, the, Pfizer the Pfizer vaccine was the one that got emergency use approval first, followed by the Moderna one. And they are both sim similar in that they are what's called messenger RNA um, vaccines. And basically they are able to attack part of the proteins involved um, in the virus structure itself. Um, they are vaccines that each require two different, two different doses to be given. The Pfizer vaccine three weeks apart from each other, the Moderna vaccine four weeks apart from each other. And they had similar um, effects on sort of preventing infection. Um, they were, each of them were studied in three to 4,000 patients um, and at many different centers in the United States and, and abroad. And um, each of them were about 94 to 95% effective after the second dose um, for getting the, the, um, the virus. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which was approved this past weekend, um, seems to be better at targeting sort of severe cases of the virus as opposed to the virus itself. It may not be as effective as the, fire, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine in preventing the infection from COVID, but it seems to be equally effective in preventing severe um, infections with COVID, which means um, meaning people getting hospitalized, going to an intensive care unit um, and, and the like. Um, you know, I think one of the questions that we don't understand about the viruses as of yet is how long were there, will their effect last? And, um, and this is the reality of clinical trials that are, that are happening over a very short period of time. We do not know the long-term effects of these vaccines. We don't know how long the antibodies that they produce or result in um, will last in someone's system and whether or not you may need a, boost, a booster down the road to really um, boost the effect of the vaccine or boost your, own, your body's own ability to fight the virus. Thanks, uh, Dr. Verma. Anything you would like to add on the, on the question of vaccines? I think in the beginning, a lot of our patients were concerned about if it's gonna change their DNA. It may sound a little bit weird at first because how does it change your cells? And initially, believe it or not, a lot of patients were asking, is it gonna change who I am? It sounds like a really is, you know, interesting question. And to understand that question, it's, it's and like Dr. Kling said, it's an mRNA. And just to give a little bit of a breakdown, if there if there's, um, just for an education tidbit, mRNA is, and DM stands as a messenger. And as an analogy, the way we explain it is that it's it's temporary. It's it's like a it's like a sticky note, or it's almost like a. I, I guess nowadays you can use the analogy of Snapchat. You know, you send a message and it, it goes away. It's not permanent. And once you read that message, you translate that message. You know, it's it's there, and then that that message, that post-it or that Snapchat goes away. So it's not really, it's not becoming a part of you, if you will. It's not changing your DNA structure. It's just a message. But that was an interesting question we used to get before is, is the mRNA back when it was novel in last year, it was, is it going to change? Is it, is it like going to change our, our DNA structure? And, and the answer is no, it's perfectly safe. It's effective. And it's really has changed uh, our speed at which we do it is because it's much easier to vaccinate, to create a vaccine. It's almost like you needing to create a script um, it's much easier if I gave you a piece of paper with a script in it of all the code, as opposed to giving you a movie. It's like me giving you a cake. If I had to make a cake for every thousand people, it would take me a thousand hours. If I just give everyone a recipe for the cake, you can all make it yourselves. And it's much quicker to duplicate a recipe than it is to perfectly duplicate a piece of cake. So that's where it 
their benefits clearly outweigh um, it's safe. The cake still tastes the same to everyone. It's the same replicator one. It's just easier, it's faster, and the manufacturing is much, much quicker. And no, it does not change your DNA. So it's, it's, it's safe to take. I love that analogy. Uh, here's, a, here's a question from the audience, um, and, and maybe for Dr. Klings. Dr. Klings mentioned the second dose being stronger than the first. Does it contain something different? What is it about that second dose that makes it stronger? Uh, that's actually a good question, and I think I probably misspoke or, or said this in a way that was more confusing. The two doses are exactly, actually the same, but it is after the second dose that a higher level of immunity is achieved. And, um, but actually, after the first dose, about 10 days after you get the first dose, you, your body will start to have... Um, the ability to fight off the COVID infection. Um, and then that is amplified um, after the second dose. So the, the vaccine, first dose and second dose is exactly the same vaccine. Um, so that, I hope that clears that up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's a question you know, that kind of relates to that. If you've already had COVID and you had a choice of vaccines, which, which path should you go down? Is it Moderna, is it Pfizer, is it Johnson and & Johnson? And, and Dr. Berman, you're, you're nodding your head. Do you want to kind of take that one? Well, I, I know Dr. Clint has an opinion and I'm just going to preface her, her answer. I'm just going to give a generalized <laughs> approach. And the answer is that what I want to just bring out is when you're, when you're looking at which vaccine to get and if you've already had COVID, there's still research. And the whole reason we still recommend it now is because we're not sure if the immunity lasts and how long it lasts. And because we're not sure, we recommend both at the same point. I don't think it makes a difference which, but Dr. Kling will follow up on. But it's almost like the analogy, I guess, to explain it better, it's like um, if someone comes into your home and you realize they're, they have, uh, they're one of your people who come to rob your front porch, for example, you look at the ring, my whatever, you see that, okay, they're, now you know their face. So if you see them again coming down the street, you'll know who they are but you have to see them at the first place to recognize them the second time. They're the same person. So once you get the first vaccine, your body gets an idea of what the face looks like. So when you see them a second time, you're like, aha, I know you, let's target, let's get all of our police, cops, guns out, let's do it quickly, fast. Um, so it, as long as you get the same dose both times, not two different ones, because they're two different faces then, same dose twice, I'm not sure if it makes a difference, but let Dr. Kling's follow up on the... Um. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think the, the important piece is if you've had COVID before, it is still important to get the vaccine. And the reason being, as Dr. Burma said, we don't know how long your body's going to be protected against getting COVID again. I would agree that they're really, it's not really clear that any of the vaccines is better um, than the others. Um, there's, there are some data that are starting to emerge that, that, that possibly the Pfizer vaccine may be um, better after the first dose um, for people who have had COVID before. But I, you know, having not seen the data myself, I'm going I'm to sort of not um, universally recommend that. And I think it really, it still sort of goes with whichever um, vaccine is available for you is, is the right vaccine. And to follow that up, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. And to follow that up, let's not, I think a lot of people initially were, were, and there still are, we get questions about how many vaccines will I have to take in my lifetime? And, and, and you can, it may sound weird at first in your lifetime, I thought COVID was just this year, but we know that COVID is as a virus and virus changes shapes. Um, it's almost like you change your clothes every day you go to work. At, at home, we may with our same clothes, but you know, you change your clothes. Um, so the virus, when you have a vaccine, is targeting a piece of your clothing, for example. Think about like the color blue. If you have the virus and it's designed to see the color blue, and the next day the virus says, well, I'm going to wear green today. Well, well that vaccine is not going to recognize green. You want to see blue. So the next booster dose, so to speak, or the next next, maybe the next cycle, whatever iteration it is, now you're going to add the green to the blue, which we weren't covered before. So it's not a new vaccine, but it's expanding what the vaccine can see. And that helps you cover the different strains that are coming on beyond what we have now, similar to the flu, almost. So 
it's uh, it's reasonable to expect boosters, and it's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean the first one didn't work. It's just that we're exp expanding our uh, coverage. Have either of you encountered uh, examples of the newer strains? Is, is that something you've come across in, in your work, or, uh, or or especially maybe in Boston, someplace like that? Is that something you had to deal with? Um, so reportedly, we um, I think there have been a, about forty to fifty patients. Um, who have um, who have the newer strain um, around around Boston? I just saw something about this uh, last week from our um, chief medical officer at our hospital. Um, from my experience, it hasn't been any different um, than the older strains of COVID in terms of uh, of how people um, are presenting. And I, I'm not sure that anybody that I was taking care of in the ICU had the newer strain. Nobody mentioned it to me, so I don't, I don't think I don't think any of them did. But uh, so, so I would say my experience has been pretty limited so far. And I'll, right, thank uh, you. Go ahead. No, no, I'll pass. We are getting some questions from the Facebook audience, and I'll probably try to get through a couple of those before we uh, move back to our own pre pre prepared questions. But um, do you have advice for someone who might have asthma? Is there a risk in terms of getting the vaccine and what it might might do to you after the fact? For either of you. So um, people with asthma are considered to be um, at higher risk from having complications um, from COVID. And um, these are, um, depending on which state you live in, um, this is one of the conditions that is considered to be a high risk condition that may actually get you prioritized for getting the vaccine. Um, you know, one of the concerns I have in people who have asthma is that often people with asthma also have allergies. And specifically, um, we have seen some allergic reactions to um, the um, Pfizer um, and um, maybe less so the Moderna vaccine. And, it's, and it seems to be the people who are at risk for having allergic reactions to, um, to these vaccines are people who have had a problem with allergies to vaccines specifically in the past. Um, and so if you've not had a problem getting other vaccines like the flu shot, um, the measles, you know, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, all of those type of vaccines, then you should have really no problem with this. And I would say I don't have any specific concerns for someone with asthma getting the vaccine. Good news for asthma folks. Here's one also from Facebook. Uh, based on everything I've heard, this is the question asker, uh, why not have a second dose of the Johnson vaccine would alleviate it, elevate it to the same effectiveness as the others? That's an interesting question. Dr. Klings, you want to try that one? Um, I'm actually not sure what um, what my response to that's going to be. Um, and mainly because I haven't looked at all of the Johnson & Johnson data. But, but I think that um, the issue is I do not believe there was um, a second dose given in the clinical trial with Johnson & Johnson. So I'm not sure that it necessarily would have an additive effect, but I don't know, maybe Dr. Verma knows a little bit more about this than I do. And I'll, I'm not gonna speculate and go for the evidence that I'm not, I don't think we have the evidence. So therefore I'm, I'll also, I'll, I'll say that I'm, I'm not sure for the end. Good question. Yeah. Here's another good question. And Dr. Verma will keep you right there for this one. Um, COVID seems to affect so many systems of the body, circulatory, nervous system, so much more than just a, a respiratory virus that we think of. Do scientists really understand why that is? I think it's, I mean, you can use the same analogy as anything else. When you have uh, an infection, for example, in, in your stomach, um, and when you have a stomach infection, a lot of times people will end up getting something called reactive arthritis. Um, it has a word reactive to it, but it just goes to say that our immune system is linked. Um, we have our immune system is in basically surveilling all of our all of our our organs. And one way to think of it in, in simple terms would be looking at a city. If you have a city block um, and you have different you know neighborhoods in each city, if neighborhood one sees that there has been a robbery and then someone pulls the alarm and that person is now on the move, on the run, they're gonna go through different neighborhoods. They're gonna go through different streets and the police, are, uh, police being the immune system are gonna target and follow that through. 
So as the lymph nodes or as the different systems are being drained and channeled through the different ways, you can have an overlap. In other words, all the neighborhoods are under lockdown for now, right? Because of something started in one place, but now has spread, not in the sense that it has disappeared and appeared, but because the same systems are in place, the same police are in the different neighborhoods, but because one area saw it, they radioed in, hey, something is not right. Let's prepare, let's get ready for this threat that's coming in. That sort of activates the other neighborhoods, if you speak. And in this case, that could be different organs that are involved, which is how in an unseemingly trivial minor event that seems like how could that trigger something as serious as, as something that it did, does happen. And that's that cross reactivity of the immune system. That's why we have in pediatrics, the Kawasaki, like the cardiomyopathy, like the, the, the thrombus, for example, a lot of people with COVID have been getting blood clots and you may see how does something in the lung make you have strokes or heart attacks. It's because of the immune system is all over and we use it all the time. I think a lot of people when they say immune system, I think the understanding is when the immune system isn't working. But if the immune system, it's working every single day, every second of our lives, like every time we eat, we're protecting ourselves from the food, right? <laughs> from attacking us from, so we have that, that balance, so to speak. So the immune system is always protecting us. It's only when that balance tips over and depending on what organ you're in, it can tip over either a lot. And if the other organs aren't able to compensate, they also tip over, it's like a domino effect if that answers the question. I think so, thank you. Here's one from the, from the audience that probably should go to Dr. Klings. What, what have you seen? Have you seen any issues with long haul COVID? Which we've been hearing a lot about in places like media where I am. What happens to the lungs in that situation? That's a good question. And that's something that I don't completely understand um, at this point, but I have seen several patients, actually several patients who, who referred themselves to me um, after getting COVID. So they weren't my patients before they got COVID. Um, and why they were coming to see me was for increased shortness of breath that seemed to last um, for weeks to even several months after they got the infection. And um, and these were people that, that exercised regularly before, had um, really, you know, were in great shape, didn't have any issues with their breathing um, before getting COVID, had really didn't have a reason to see a pulmonologist. I think, you know, from our experience with other types of viral infections, um, particularly um, H1N1, um, there can be some long-term effects that happen to the lungs after you get one of these viruses. And you can see that either there can be abnormalities that persist um, on someone's CAT scan or ch chest X-ray of the lung. But also more importantly, if you follow pulmonary function testing, which is a way of looking at lung function, they may, there may be some changes in the long-term. I will tell you that, that it seems like the people at least that I've been following after COVID seem to eventually get better. It just seems to take longer than you would think um, for after they were sick for about a week. Um, and um, to have sort of weeks to months of symptoms afterwards seems to be um, a bit out of sync. But, um, but I think there is a lot of interest in really understanding what happens after you get COVID um, to, a greater, to a greater extent, particularly in our patients who have survived being in an intensive care unit or in the hospital, what happens to their lungs long-term? And, and you know, are there gonna be after effects of this whole um, process? So I, I would say a lot of this we don't know yet. Remind our, our viewing audience, if you're watching on Zoom, you can post questions in the Q&A function. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can pop questions right onto that Facebook page and we will get them answered for you if we can. Here's one more from the audience. Uh, I've heard that older individuals are having fewer side effects from the mRNA vaccine, vaccines. Why would that be? And that could be for either of you. Anybody want to tackle that? Um, I would say that I'm not sure why, um, why that may be. I, am, I will say that from my practice, I'm happy to say that many of my patients are starting to get vaccinated. Um, and, um, and that, um, so I've now been able to 
um, speak with them after their vaccine experience. And most of my older patients, I would agree, have not had much of a reaction, but some of our younger patients haven't as well. And, you know, I think the response to the vaccine that I've observed has been very variable um, from people having almost no symptoms to having arm pain where they get, where they get the vaccine. Um, and then, you know, a smaller percentage will have fevers, chills, feel like crap for a day or two, um, but then it goes away. And, and I have not uh, run into anybody who's had symptoms more than a couple of days. Here's a good follow-up question that's popped in. Will taking antibiotics or any medication for, inf for inflammation decrease the efficacy of the vaccine once you, as you got to deal with it? That is true. And I think that is a, a big part of, of a lot of the rheumatology diseases and medications where we inherently use um, not antibiotics per se, we do use things like dapsone. Well, technically hydroxychloroquine is an antibiotic for malaria, so that counts. Um, and that's been recommended to continue despite um, all stages of COVID. There's medications that we use for inflammation, in fact, a majority of them. And yes, it's true that they do affect the efficacy of the vaccine. The two in particular that are more so uh, one is methotrexate, and that's been true even for other vaccines. We know that it affects the response to the vaccine, and generally the guideline is to hold the dose immediately after the vaccine. Um, and methotrexate, for who don't know, it's, it's used for a lot of autoimmune conditions, and it's given once a week. It's not every day. So when you have the, the first dose of the vaccine, you, give, you hold the following dose. Um, and that's because you don't want your immune system to have, you want the immune system to respond to the vaccine. You don't want it to be lagged behind because of methotrexate. Same thing with things like rituximab, which lowers your antibody levels from your B cells. You want your B cells to make the, you want your immune system to make the antibodies, not suppress them. So in that case, the guideline is to take the vaccine near the end of the cycle. And rituximab is given once every six months. So that could be a long time. That means getting it four months later, like in the four weeks before your next dose. And even something as, as common as prednisone, we know prednisone or steroid for, for any of them really, it's, we know that doses more than 10 milligrams increase your risk for hospitalization. 10 milligrams is not a lot, but there may be, I don't have, I'm, they're sort of looking into, but I think there may be also the higher the dose, the less robust the vaccine. So the generally you'll try and not prefer to have high dose corticos or high dose steroids um, the same way. So definitely things that alter inflammation de almost, they definitely do. And there's some that don't, and there's many that don't. And in those cases, we continue them. And the answer in part is also what you're treating it for. Oftentimes, if you stop the medication, and if you have a flare of the disease, oftentimes the flare in itself is associated with worse COVID outcomes, with increased risk for hospitalization and death. Something as simple as, as for example, in a, in a lupus patient who's taking an immunosuppressive medications. A flare for them could mean being in a hospital setting, which means more exposure in the community, and paradoxically requiring more immunosuppression to control if you hold it. So that's why it's not a hard, but it is a case by case. So how about this? Here's a follow up. Can I take aspirin, Tylenol, naproxen? You know, what, what how about some of those kind of over the counter options? From my side, there's there actually are official recommendations for that. American College of Rheumatology has has those. And um, in a brief summary, like I'm not going to go into the, 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 the technical details, but if you have confirmed, and definitely if you have severe infections, it is recommended to hold them. Uh, those who are presumptive or like exposure, for example, who have uh, potentially been exposed, you, you can continue them. And it does not affect the vaccine response per se. And a lot of times we do use it because you want to avoid things like steroids. So it is an alternative and we end up using it often and it does not have adverse effects uh, from a COVID perspective. You know, clinically, you should always talk with your doctor, but clinically it does not have adverse effects from that perspective. Dr. Klings, we have a follow-up to the long haulers question and answer we had earlier. Have you seen any neurological symptoms in COVID long haulers, consistencies? That, that's a great question. I, I, I would say that I personally haven't other than headaches. Um, and so I have not seen 
any of the uh, brain fog and other things that I've seen um, um, on Facebook and other um, media outlets. So, uh, you know, in my own practice, but you know, I am a lung doctor. I think primary care physicians probably are seeing a lot more of that. Here's another one I'll let you handle if you, if you would. Um, this comes from Joyce in the audience. Has there been any consistent variable identified among people who test positive but are asymptomatic? That's a really good question. You know, I think that even though we've heard a lot about people who are at high risk from COVID and diseases that put people at high risk, I would say even within those populations, um, there's a spectrum of disease. If you look at people with sickle cell disease, for example, a disease I spend a lot of time in, um, and sickle cell disease is thought to put people at higher risk for having complications from COVID. There are people with sickle cell disease who don't have any symptoms when they get COVID. And so, um, so and, but then there are people who get incredibly sick and, and a lot of our, our patients do need to be hospitalized with COVID. So there is a, still a whole spectrum of disease. And so the converse is true that we really do not know um, why some people are asymptomatic versus not. There's not one necessary variable. You know, there's a lot of talk about, well, younger patients are much less likely to develop symptoms. And that may be true for children, but we see many young adults who actually um, have a lot of symptoms related to COVID. And I think it's not as cut and dry. And I think one of the things that's been really confusing about this disease is that um, there is so much heterogeneity or a difference in the response to it amongst people. Thank you. Here's a, a good question from the panel or for the panel from outside. Um, somewhat specific, I'll ask it and, and, and you know, one of you can take it. My dad fell and hurt his ribs. He is afraid to go to the hospital because he is one week away from his second shot of Moderna. He is afraid he will get something that may interfere with the shot. What should I say to him? Either of you feel like taking that one on? I can follow up with a, a similar patients, and we have these these patients who maybe, for example, having a flare of their disease. Um, an example, for example, you have a rheumatoid arthritis patient who is flaring where the joints are swollen, stiff, tender, and to the point where they have a hard time getting out of bed. And they ask you, how can I treat this without going to the ER? And they're sure they don't want to go to the ER. They don't want to be exposed. They're like, I don't want to take that risk. But the alternative you know, how do you treat a flare? Is it going to be, is it going to be steroids? And, and that's potentially putting them at high risk for, for the short-term duration. Mostly for the hospital setting, you now going to a medical facility, I just, generally speaking, um, it's not going to be, you'll be well taken care of. So there's nothing that way interfere directly because no one's going to be giving you immunosuppressive medications for this. And pain management, like with the previous question about naproxen, Tylenol, uh, or even other pain meds, do not interfere with the mRNA vaccine. So it, it, I don't think, obviously safety first. Number one rule, do no harm. Number two, treat it to the best of your ability. And I think going to hospital, if medically necessary, should not be something you would avoid because of the fear of interfering with possibly vaccine. All right, Dr. Verma, we'll go stay with you. I'm sorry, Dr. Klings, were you gonna hop in? I would agree with that. You know, I guess it depends on how badly here it is ribs. You know, if, um, you know, I, I, if he thinks that he broke his ribs, um, I would, I would suggest going to get checked out. Um, and, um, you know, I think anybody who's going to an emergency room setting is going to be tested for COVID. And there are, you know, a lot of safety precautions that are being taken, that are taking place in the emergency room and other parts of the hospital to really protect patients and to protect the staff. Um, I may have been breaking it. Did I miss anything, Chip? Sorry, I think I just dropped off for a, my, my internet connection. Seems like it had a hiccup. I'm, I apologize. Um, were you in the middle of an answer when I left you, or, did, or are we pretty much uh, caught up there? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we were caught, caught up. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Magic of technology, right? Here's one that, that was in uh, Dr. Verma's advanced questions, and I'll, I'll throw that out there. Um, many medications in rheumatology may suppress the immune system. Can you talk a little bit more about the ability to fight infections while you're dealing with something like COVID? No, when you're dealing with the fighting of the infections and as, as and then suppressing the immune system, there are medications that we try not to use, and it depends on your exposure status and as a necessity basis. If you have something as something like vasculitis where your organs are threatened, it doesn't matter what disease, like it could be CF or even sickle cell with a crisis. You know, if you have organ threatening disease, that's not going to be something that you want to hold off treatment on irrespective of COVID risk, because the risk is imminent. It's, it's real as opposed to a potential risk. Um, and suppressing them, there are a lot of data about which medications cause uh, more harm than, or risk for hospitalization, not, not, not harm, but it's a relative term. And in, in immunosuppressive terms, things that are high dose of steroids, uh, definitely we define this as the disease modifying agents and there's different classes. The different classes have different the mechanisms and depending on which, so it is very diverse and heterogeneous. As a general rule nowadays, we it's classified into your risk for whether you're asymptomatic or and basically not exposed. If you're exposed, but not symptomatic, if you're presumptive positive, and if you have like active infection and there's different, each of those four different categories have different recommendations from the recent guidelines. So it changes. Something you may continue if you've been potentially exposed, but still not having symptoms, as opposed to being tested positive, will be two different ways of treating the same medication. Whereas something like, for example, something like NSAIDs, the recommendation has been from the quality of rheumatology that you continue it if you're exposed, but if you have a positive, you would hold it. Same thing with something like hydroxychloroquine relatively safe, and it is one of the safest medications we have, you would continue it, but if you've been presumptive positive in a hospital, you would the recommendation is still to hold things like methotrexabaflunamide. So it really varies on which stage you are. Here's a question that came in on the Q&A just a moment ago, and it's a bit of a follow-up to some of the things we've been talking about, and either of you can, can handle this, I'm sure. People have said not to take Tylenol or Advil, before getting the vaccine because it might decrease the effectiveness of the vaccine. Is there any truth to this and, uh, and why? Either? I don't think there is, I'm not sure of the evidence behind that. I'm not sure if it's proven. Um, we know that Advil or NSAIDs or, or acetaminophen don't necessarily uh, blunt your immune response. Um, one theory could be, you know, it may uh, uh, sort of mask symptoms that may be coming on, but I'm not sure if there is uh, evidence supporting one way or the other. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't, I'm not sure that there's any truth to that, um, but I haven't seen it, um, enough data to sort of know about that either. Here's a question from Facebook for, for we'll, we'll throw this at Dr. Klings. Do we know how much or how long of an immunity a person can have after getting vaccinated? I think we kind of nibbled at that question earlier. Yeah, I, I think the big take home message is we actually don't know um, how long the immunity is gonna last. You know, we know that um, I believe that the people in the original Pfizer and Moderna trials were studied for about three months um, afterwards. So we really don't know anything sort of beyond that. You know, this is a vac these are vaccines that were developed and rolled out very quickly. So can we tell you what's gonna happen five years from now? No, you know, not from what we've experienced so far. I think there are a lot of efforts to really track what is happening to people after they get the vaccine long-term. And there are ways um, when you get the vaccine to sign up to be part of that sort of tracking so that we get to understand better what happens long-term after you get the vaccine. It's the same reason, and to follow that up, it's this uncertainty is the same reason why traveling to several countries, for example, if you travel up north to Canada, crossing the land border, even if you have been vaccinated, 
you're still required to quarantine, even though you've been vaccinated. Um, and sometimes even if you test, and especially if you test negative, and particularly one of the reasons is because you're uncertain about the efficacy and, and we, we're pretty comfortable, we're not, don't have the data yet. So for that reason, we still have that assumption, go ahead. And it's almost, I think one of the questions was, you know, wearing masks, uh, not one, but two masks. Um, and many people have been wearing two masks and the, the, um, the answer that is, is more so much from a fitting perspective than opposed to a filter perspective. When you think of masks, you think you're filtering or, or the air, but really the mask is to, is to keep your, your, um, I don't want to say your, your aerosol secretions, but to keep your air localized to yourself and not spreading it to someone else. Having a second layer doesn't change that function, but the idea is that a second mask increases the better fitment and, and the seal, if you will, around it, which seems to have a better benefit. So you would wear the tighter, like the N95 or whatnot first, for, and then the second one on top to sort of seal that in. That seems to be the benefit. Of course, I think they're still looking more into it, but that's the benefit of two masks as opposed to one, not because two filter or seal in themselves better, but the fitting may be better for two than one. Dr. Kling, you can chime in. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with all that. I'm not, um, I, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything to add. I think uh, <laughs> masks up. Here's a question in the Q and A that seems to be uh, taking or not taking sulfasalinazine. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Before or during COVID vaccine, one said do not hold at all. Other said hold two weeks, two weeks before verse, first vaccination through two weeks after the second one. Um, fairly fairly complicated question. Um, hopefully you followed it. Um, that's the question. Which you, which is the right answer? I guess is, there, is what they're asking. Was sulfasalinazine? I think that one's for you, Dr. Verma. Hopefully, yeah. There we go. Um. Uh, I hope you guys, am I muted or unmuted? I can't see. You're good. Okay, so we have the College of Rheumatology. This was released just earlier this month. And to the answer the question of sulfasalazine, it comes in different ways. So when you have sulfasalazine, which is coming here, this goes in line with the other medications. So technically, no modifications to either therapy or vaccination timing. So technically, as of this month, things like sulfasalazine, lofunamide, azathioprine, a lot of the immunosuppressing agents and steroids more than 20 milligrams per day, technically with a moderate level of evidence of consensus between the, the groups, you don't need to modify it or change it depending on the timing of your vaccines. Um, this is also in this, when you say, what do we hold it or do we not, since I'm already here, Things like Plaquenil, IVIG, or steroids less than 20, there's no changes that need to be made. Versus things like methotrexate, you should hold for one week after, the, hold the first dose after your, your vaccine. Same thing with the tofacitinib or the, the Rinvoq, um, the upadacitinib. Same thing with the abatacept to hold the week prior and then one week after the first vaccine only but not the second. So it really, it really is, is specific. Um, same thing we're talking about. And these are guidelines. Um, these are based on the latest evidence. So this may change um, as more data becomes available. And as we, and this is public available. If you just type in American College of Rheumatology uh, guidelines, this, this will come up. So sulfasalazine by the latest guidelines to answer your question uh, with a moderate level of consensus does not need to be um, modified before or after. We had that graphic pretty handy there. That was good. Thank you. We're down to about five minutes or so uh, in terms of the time we usually have for these. And I, I, we're really rolling along, so I apologize for that. Let's ask kind of a question I think everybody has on their mind. We, we're all wearing masks. How long are we going to be doing that, given the fact that we're now into this, well into the vaccination period? What can you say in terms of how the calendar looks going forward? for how uh, COVID is going to impact us socially and as a, as, a, as a country. Dr. Berman, you want to start? 
It is a cultural change. Now, this is opinion based. So disclaimer, this is not based on evidence. Uh, and I think the, the consensus has been at least, I mean, Dr. Fauci and everyone, at least for the next one year, but as a cultural change, we have other countries who wear masks even without a pandemic. Um, and that's been going on already. And you can look at that in certain countries. We have not been as accustomed to a pandemic and our culture has not embraced masks. Um, one can argue we still don't, but it, that, that cultural shift may uh, take some time. And that time may be generations. But as far as to answer the question of how long, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of it even during the, the seasons, like the flu season or the, the next COVID season. Uh, but for the immediate future, I don't, I think at least for the next one year, how long beyond that, I'm not certain, but I think the consensus has been into 2022 at some point, opinion only, not evidence-based. Dr. Klings, you wanna to add to that? Um, I would agree um, with the, the one year time frame. You know, I'm hopeful, the, the non-medicine side of me is hopeful that the summer and fall will um, be more sort of of a normal sort of life um, that we're more, much more accustomed to um, than this past year has been. And, um, and that, you know, we will start to be able to do some things that we're not, um, we were not able to um, over the winter and, um, and, this, and, the, and this past um, year. Um, but I think that um, what what has become clear to me over the last year is that it, it this this whole situation has been a little bit difficult to predict um, going forward. Um, so I think you know the key thing is really um, rolling out the vaccines and um, and trying to um, stick with um, social distancing and wearing masks um, for the time being. Thank you. One last question from the audience. We'll try to sneak in here under the bell. Uh, Dr. Klings, I've got you on my screen, so I'll ask you. Um, my 73-year-old cousin has been fighting COVID since January 3rd of this year. Each day she has different issues that seem to hit her. It's an uphill battle. At what point can we say there's light at the end of the tunnel for this person? That's a really good question. And you know, I think one of the challenges that we've seen um, for people who are infected with COVID, for some of them, is that this can go on for weeks to months. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure if your cousin, if, if the cousin involved is in a hospital setting or at home. Um, but, you know, I think that um, either way, um, symptoms can last um, for weeks to months. And, you know, I think that really, um, you know, once sort of there's you you reach a point where nothing new is developing and things are starting to maybe slowly get better that may be when you start to see some light at the end of the tunnel but i but i i i, I would just tell you to hang in there and that this you know hopefully will get better over time thank you very much thank you both this has been a fascinating session do either of you have something you'd like to say before we go, something we didn't talk about that you wanted to make sure you mentioned? I'd like to just leave off with hope. The uh, I know it's been, uh, I think a lot of times the COVID pandemic, the toll has been separation from families. Uh, those who may be living in nursing homes or those who may be living in different uh, continents or even across borders where you've had a, a difficult uh, time communicating and what we call non-essential travel, yes, in the beginning, but once you are away from family for years, uh, even that small visit becomes essential at a certain point. But to not let that um, to not let that waver and and be strong mentally and physically at the same time. And like the question earlier about how long do we hold out for? I think and there's case reports of people being on ICU ECMOs and coming out of it after a long time. So. I'll just leave with, well, well, thank you for having this session and also one about hope that we're still all in this together and then that we are better together and, and working together than either one alone. So yes, maybe separated, but together at the same time, if that makes sense. Fantastic, thank you. Um, 
I would remind the audience, we, we do this pretty much every Tuesday. Next Tuesday, we'll be talking with local leaders here in the Johnstown area about what they're seeing and what they're doing. I would again thank our two fantastic panelists, Dr. Klings, Dr. Dr. Verma. Thank you so much for bringing your expertise and your, your willingness to share with our audience. Thanks again to In This Together Cambria and the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown for hosting. This has been a fantastic session. Thank you all. Everybody be safe out there. Good night.